Hey everybody, Nick here again. And just wanted to do this video on Letter from Birmingham Jail. Um, just so you know, this is actually like my second or third time trying to do this video because I ran out of, ran into some technical difficulties while I was trying to do it. So uh, hopefully things will go smoothly this time. We shall see. So, okay, so first of all, uh, Letter from Birmingham Jail is uh, one of the most important uh, uh, essays uh, written in recent American history, I would say. Uh, you know, it was composed in April 1963 and stands really as the uh, maybe central statement of the American Civil Rights Movement. Um, uh, certainly, uh, it's this, the, the primary statement that lays out um, the goals of the, um, uh, so, some of the direct goals of the movement. Um, and uh, um, the need, right, for the movement, why we're doing this, like the reasons for the movement. Um, and uh, it uh, directly kind of is addressed to a group of people who were kind of saying to King at the time, hey, like, why are you doing this? This is causing a lot of trouble. Um, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing this, basically. And this was his reply to them, this letter uh, was his sort of pointed reply, and we get that in the note that he has, um, you know, here. Um, and this version of it basically is, um, uh, uh, as he says, uh, a slightly polished version of the original original version, uh, which was written, as he points out, under, you know, pretty um, uh, not ideal circumstances. He was in jail. He originally was writing it in the margins of the newspaper where the note that the clergymen who were complaining about his actions was. So he started, you know, jotting uh, his response down to them. Uh, and then this developed over time. Eventually his lawyers uh, were able to get him a pad of paper and a pen where he could uh, finish this. Um, but, uh, um, while he was in jail, but, uh, um, and then once it, he was out of jail, they, they polished it, uh, for publication, uh, um, and that's the version we have here. Um, and, uh, um, so it was, again, not written under ideal circumstances, um, uh, sort of, you know, him doing this in, in jail. Um, we might talk for a minute about why King was in jail. Um, officially he was in jail for... Um, parading without a permit is the was the charge against him, um, and this is uh, a pretty clear example of what King calls a law that, on the face of it, isn't actually a unjust law, but is deployed in such a way that it actually is an unjust law, or it becomes an unjust law. Um, so, for example, basically, it's a, it was a it was a law that required that if you were in Birmingham and you were going to have um, like a parade or something like that, you had to have a permit from the city that said, hey, uh, I have permission to you know, like use these streets or whatever, and um, that's, you know, that basically I have permission to do that. Um, now, here's the thing. The, uh, the, the, the movement that King belonged to, they'd been talking to the city for months and been trying to get them to agree to um, uh, uh, issuing them a permit for this march that they were planning on having. And uh, the city just wouldn't issue them the permit, basically. Um, and so eventually they were put in this position of saying to themselves, okay, well, are we just going to have the march anyway? Because they would ne well, clearly never us issue us the permit. And so they decided, yes, that they would go ahead and do the march and, uh, um, and face the consequences. Now, this is part, was, part of, uh, was part of their planned direct action program, as they called it, what they called nonviolent direct action. So a peaceful march, right, you know, uh, that they're going to, going to go on, uh, probably people carrying signs that uh, sort of talking about the issues that they were concerned about, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then they were arrested for that. Um, they uh, were arrested. So this is an example of this, on the face of it, a law that is, uh, you know, on the face of it, like it seems reasonable for the city to require people to have permits to have parades, right? But in this case, the law is being deployed to silence a group of people who the community isn't interested in hearing from, right? Uh, and so the community has decided that, hey, we're going to um, uh, we're going to actively suppress this group of people, prevent them ha from having their march. And then when they do try to do something, we're going to arrest them. 
right? Uh, so this is this is what uh, the position the king was in, uh, knowing full well probably that he was going to get arrested when this happened. And of course, then he reads uh, in the newspaper the reply uh, from these uh, um, fellow uh, church leaders. These are um, some of the various religious leaders, not all of them uh, uh, Christian leaders, uh, some of them Jewish leaders, um, Catholic uh, leaders, all, and then uh, Protestant Christian leaders as well. So you've got uh, um, uh, a variety of different religious leaders um, condemning him, right? You know, some of the, you know, people he considers to be his colleagues, right? You know, um, you know, his other, uh, you know, uh, clergymen and religious leaders, um, sees them as like, okay, well, um, uh, so, so we, we've got, uh, the, 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 the bishops, these rabbis, um, uh, and various reverends, uh, all sort of condemning him. Right. Um, and, uh, and now he's writing that I'm, cause they, and they basically have said, Hey, you're stirring up all this sort of trouble and resentment in the community and you shouldn't be doing that. Um, we don't like the idea that you're getting arrested, that you're breaking the law. Right. And King's saying like, well, yes, but what laws am I breaking? First of all, uh, and why am I breaking those laws? Right. Let's just be clear about that. Like, you know, um, uh, and they they are uh, engaging in nonviolent direct action. So uh, doing things like parading down the street, sitting at a lunch lunch counter. Right. You know, protesting. Those are the things that they're doing. Right. That's the kind of nonviolent direct action they're taking. But because some of these people are getting arrested in the process of that, the religious leaders are saying like, hey, we don't think this is right that you're doing that. You shouldn't be breaking the law. Right. Uh, but King's like, but look, these laws are actively oppressive to people in my community. And that's actually one of the main things that they're trying to address is to get these laws changed. Right. Um, Birmingham at the time in 1963 was possibly one of the most segregated cities in the United States. It was pretty much the most segregated city, as King asserts here. Um, it, uh, you know, so uh, he, he was saying, like, look, we have a lot to address in this community. Um, and of course, segregation was something that went back to uh, the very um, beginnings of the, um, or the, the very, uh, um, going, goes back to the, the time when slavery ended, and we had a period of time after that, right, where there was maybe going to be an attempted enfranchisement of African Americans that never really materialized, right? That um, there were some laws in the books, there were discussions about, um, uh, um, uh, for having blacks form their own political parties and also being granted like land and, and rights and things like that, um, you know, and then very quickly, um, especially once the northerners left the south, right after the Civil War, right, once the uh, Reconstruction period was over, then the southerners very much very quickly tried to just turn things back to the way they were. Um, now, they could not legally re-enslave African Americans because there was an amendment to the Constitution now that prevented that. Um, but uh, um, once that, so slavery was illegal, um, uh, um, no matter what, there was no way for them to change that now. Um, but um, once, um, uh, but, but, but um, once things went back to the way they, when, once the Northerners are gone, the Southerners then were like, okay, we're going to do everything we can to basically remove the rights of African Americans in the South effectively. Um, okay, we can't re-enslave them. We'll do everything we can to prevent them from having any kind of uh, political, political or economic uh, power. So we're going to make sure that they can't vote. We're going to make sure that they can't, um, uh, um, don't have access to kind of uh, money and uh, opportunities and equalities uh, that that um, that uh, whites do, and uh, this is basically what happened in the South, right? So you had this whole system of laws uh, and uh, that were developed to act to legally oppress the community. 
And then you had a whole series of extra legal methods that were also utilized to, to oppress the community, which were things like, you know, act the active, uh, sometimes even violent oppression of the community. Um, so you had things like the Ku Klux Klan, you know, you know, burning and bombing churches and, um, uh, um, lynchings that would go on and, and this kind of thing. And this, this was, this was uh, um, ongoing activities in the South. And of course, these extra legal activities that would occur um, wor worked in tandem, right, to create this whole system that sort of actively oppressed the community, right? And those extra legal things, even though they were, okay, it's like technically illegal to like, you know, set fire to a church or whatever in the South, but if you're, uh, um, it was a black church in, you know, a black neighborhood, um, the law enforcement officials uh, at that time were probably not going to pay attention to that case in the same way that they would pay attention to if it had happened to a white church. That was, that was um, uh, part of the, uh, what they were dealing with here, right, was that, that there was this um, sort of working of these both sides of the oppressive system, right? So you had the active sort of uh, legal oppression and you had the, the additional sort of extra legal um, sort of um, uh, or, or illegal oppression that was occurring um, at the same time. Um, you know, so, uh, and then of course, in, when we talk about segregation, the thing most people tend to think about is the kind of separate facilities and things like that that were, that were uh, set up for African Americans and whites. That's that's kind of the the sort of classic example. You get two drinking fountains. We have uh, separate restrooms, like this kind of thing. Um, so that that's I think uh, the kind of uh, what people often imagine. But it went far beyond that too, uh, to things like you know you had separate stores and things like that that you could shop at, um, and that becomes a real issue here as we'll talk about because that's that's one of the things that they're trying to get changed. Um, so, um, my cat's scratching at the door again, so I'm going to let him in because I don't want to have to listen to that. I should, I should have learned my lesson, but, uh, anyway, um, sorry guys. Uh, occasion, I know that's happened a few times, but, uh, anyway, uh, hi Marshall. Okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> now he's right here. Hello. Um, so where was I? I was talking about the, uh, Birmingham and what was going on there. So, so like, for example, you had these different facilities. Uh, the thing I was going to mention about the stores was, was that basically, um, the stores in Birmingham had signs in the window that said, uh, no blacks, right? So you, you were not allowed to shop at the store if you were, uh, black, um, and so what happened was, is the, uh, King's, uh, organization had spent uh, a long time talking to the business community in Birmingham and saying, getting them to come to the negotiating table to say, Hey, you should, uh, voluntarily, uh, remove those signs and allow us to shop in your stores. Um, and that, so they were trying to get progress made on that front right, by, by having um, the community um, actually just voluntarily sort of uh, get rid of these sort of racist uh, uh, signs and things like that, these discriminatory signs that were sort of in the window of the stores. If they had done that, then, that, then there would have been some progress made, right? But they spent months negotiating with these stores, and the end result of it was, was that, as King mentions, that basically a few stores took the signs out of the window for a few days and then they just put them back in the window and then stump stores never removed them at all. So, you know, even though they kind of got promises from the community that they would, that they would do this. Right. Uh, but, um, clearly there was no real will on the part of the store owners to do this. Right. You know, either because of their own, you know, racist inclinations or because they just thought that's just how it should be, or, you know, because maybe their customers pressured them to put the signs back in the window. Like, who knows what, what was going on with the business owners? But uh, at any rate, they didn't change the signs. And so the, um, uh, the, uh, 
king and his uh, fellows, who'd been in good faith negotiating with them, uh, kind of saw that they had reached the end of the road, right? Like, we, we really uh, have gone as far as we can uh, with them as far as, like, pursuing a kind of uh, let's let's get them to come to the table and negotiate kind of approach. And now we're kind of in the space where we kind of have to take other measures, which is means active protesting, right? Active protesting, active movement uh to get things changed right uh through this nonviolent direct action program so that that's basically what where they kind of are in this um they've uh realized that uh that they they don't that 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 this isn't going to change by itself right um as king notes right that um you can't that these things don't just change uh, um, by themselves, the uh, the oppressor, right, doesn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to stop oppressing this group of people. Um, let's just change all these laws uh, just because, just because, right? And that's one of the problems that King is kind of noting with the whole approach that these pastors and uh, um, religious leaders are sort of saying to him that like, oh, you should... Um, uh, you should wait, you know, until things at a more ideal time. You know, these things do take time. You know, this is a big change for people. You know, uh, th this is how the South has kind of been for a very long time. So, you know, people are going to have to, you know, get used to these changes. And this this was the kind of arguments that, that King was sort of getting that, you know, like, um, you know, and his reply to this was, well, I mean, how long are we supposed to wait, Right. Um, these are, um, you know, th this is, this is, uh, um, uh, um, he says, uh, for years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ears of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one, uh, see, uh, with one of our distinguished jurists that quote, justice too long delayed is justice denied, Right. So that if, if we see that, that basically um, we have put off um, uh, blacks being um, given their rights uh, um, for so long, that, that it, and that, that how much longer are we supposed to wait? I mean, it's been what? How long? 400 years, right? And there's some states where, you know, I mean, as he points out here, like there are some counties in Alabama that have the majority of a majority of black citizens in them, but not a single black person is registered to vote in that county. And King raises very rightly, he sort of raises his eyebrow and says, like, so does that sound like democracy to you? What does that sound like? Like, if not democracy, right? It's clearly not democracy, right? Uh, because these people are being actively prevented from voting. So that's the other side to this is that, that, um, uh, the, you have the, um, amongst in, in, as far as the voting goes, you have both the sort of illegal kind of, well, it's not even necessarily illegal, but the, you have these sort of, um, uh, extra legal methods of preventing people from voting, like, like actual intimidation, like people waiting around at the polling place, making sure that black people don't show up there. Right. And then you have, um, so intimidation of voters. Right. And then on the other side of it, you have, um, all of these arcane laws and things that exist that are there to prevent blacks from voting, uh, that make it difficult for them to vote. Uh, so for example, um, uh, like you, you have like the, the, the weird kind of grandfather law that was sort of existed where it was like, these were laws that were established in the wake of the civil war where they said something to the effect of, if your grandfather couldn't vote in this state, then you're not allowed to register to vote. And so if you were a recently freed slave, then of course your grandfather it was highly unlikely that he was able to vote in the state so clearly you're not going to be able to vote and if you can't vote then that therefore by extension means that your grandkids won't be able to vote so pretty much nobody in your family if as long as you stay in this state is ever going to be able to vote basically so you've created a whole permanent underclass of people with that one law 
of people who will never be able to vote. And then in other states where you did have things were, were um, you know, you didn't necessarily have those kind of laws. Uh, you, you had other laws that were developed to can, to disenfranchise um, African Americans. Uh, amongst these were things like um, literacy tests that were not intended for them to pass, right? So these were um, uh, African Americans, well, first of all, had less access to uh, educational resources. So uh, they had a higher percentage of people who were uh, um, not literate. But also, in addition to that, um, uh, um, these tests, when they were actively administered, uh, to uh, to uh, to Harvard graduates, these there was they recently did this. They gave uh, a group of Harvard graduates uh, um, a few years ago some of these tests that were utilized at the time to test people to see if they were literate. Um, and the Harvard graduates all failed this test. And the reason they failed it is because these tests were not designed for people to pass them. Right. They were designed for you to fail them because they did not want blacks to pass these tests because they did not want them to be able to vote. Right. So so this isn't really about literacy or anything like that. It's really just about oppressing blacks and preventing them from voting. That's really what this comes down to. And also, I have to say, like, what does your ability to read have to do with your ability to vote? Voting is a right, an inherent right that people should have, and that, that your ability to, you, you know, read uh, uh, shouldn't uh, depend on that, right? So it's, a, a you know, uh, I remember about 10 years ago, uh, you know, 15 years ago, something like that, there was a lot of people sort of talking up again, we should reinstitute uh, um, these kind of tests or whatever. It was a sort of talking point that sort of came up at various points. And uh, um, I don't know if these people, whoever who were saying that, they, uh, uh, I don't know if they were aware of the kind of racist history uh, that those kind of tests uh, have had sort of attached to them. But, uh, but that's the other thing. So anytime you hear anybody proposing things like, uh, um, let's reinstitute um, uh, literacy, literacy tests for voting, you know, that's a, that's a red flag because that has a pretty uh, um, intensively uh, um, racist history attached to it. So uh, just, just, just so you know. Um, anyway, but, uh, um, but yeah, these tests were not designed for people to pass them. And so the, King doesn't talk about those kind of things specifically, uh, but that, that was amongst the array of things that were sort of just keeping blacks from voting. Uh, again, uh, so there, there was all of these different laws that sort of prevented that. Um, and uh, again, this comes down to him saying like, hey, like how long are people in my community supposed to wait around for white people to decide that they should just have their rights, right? You know, um, in some ways, this is a little bit in dialogue with the Declaration of Independence, which um, the Declaration uh, basically says, um, you know, all men are created equal, right? There it is. Uh, um, and uh, so it's this founding document of our country that asserts the equality of humans, right, uh, of all peoples, right? Uh, but um, it doesn't, it did, our country did not extend that to uh, African Americans. So here we are, it's 1963, and Martin Luther King is basically asking the country, and these, specifically these religious leaders, guys like, hey, you wrote this document back in the day in 1776 that said this, presented this idea, and you have not lived up to that idea. Live up to your own document for once, right? Why don't you try doing that? And that's basically what King is, in some ways, sort of asking America to do, right? Um, um, and he talks here about, like, look, you're upset at me for breaking these laws, right? But what laws am I breaking? I'm breaking these laws that are unjust laws. They're laws that are being used to actively oppress people in my community, right? So these laws about, you know, just if I'm a black person walking down the streets in Birmingham, right, you know, and I see this store, or this sign in the window that says no blacks, like I'm not allowed to go in there, right? 
but um, and it's a, it, it's a sign that's also telling me, hey, I'm 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 not a full member of this society, right? I'm not being treated equally as other citizens, and this is King says a sure sign of an unjust law, right? An unjust law is a law that basically treats a minority group, right, differently than it does the majority group. It's like the majority group doesn't apply this law to itself, but it only applies it to this group of people, right? Uh, laws have to be applied universally for them to be um, just, right? That's what he's saying, right? They have to be applied universally, right? So, like, for example, if we passed a law that said, you know, it was illegal for people with green eyes to drive over 55 miles an hour, right? You know, that law would be an unjust law because you'd be like, hey, these people, uh, like, wh why are you, why are you actively oppressing this group of people? You know, like, uh, just because I have green eyes, I get treated differently, right? So, so you start to see, but this is, that's, that's effectively the kind of thing King is pointing out here is you can't have laws like that, right? That um, are just nakedly discriminatory. They're unjust, right? Uh, by their very nature, um, uh, King, King has this pretty intense breakdown. Uh, um, he says, any law that uplifts the human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is un unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. So that's him talking about on just another level. There's this whole other level on which these laws are damaging, right? So he's saying like to these leaders saying, hey, on just on this level, you should be opposed to these laws, right? Um, uh, just by the way they sort of affect people. Um, and then, of course, there's the... Um, the, the the thing I just mentioned where, you know, you're, you're treating actively, you're not applying these laws in any kind of universal way. You're using them to actively oppress a particular group of people, right? Um, okay. Uh, and he says, and then he, he, he doesn't call this out directly, or I guess, yeah, he does actually say this. Um, he says, sometimes the law is just on its face and unjust in its applications. And that's when he says, for instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. In other words, nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade. So that's the point I mentioned earlier about this. So this is where, where King is sort of mentioning that. Um, and so this, this ties into this whole idea of like, he's making the distinction here. There's, there's just laws and unjust laws. And he says, look, I'll be the first person in line to follow a just law, right? But these laws that we're talking about here, these laws that keep African Americans uh, from voting, that keep us from having full access to things, or laws that are kind of humili humiliations of us, just everyday humiliations of just like, hey, you can't come in this store. Hey, you can't sit at this lunch counter. Hey, you're a second class citizen. Um, those, those little reminders, right? Uh, um, of that um, are, are, are just nakedly uh, unjust, right? Um, uh, so so he's, he's, he's making that um, uh, clear here. Um, okay. Uh, and he talks about, like, that there's a, there's a long history also, by the way, that he's operating in a history of people who they would probably support, right? Um, uh, you know, people who, and people who are actively attacked and oppressed uh, for um, opposing things. And he says, look, now I'm being attacked and you're saying I shouldn't be doing these things, right? Um, but he's saying, he says, uh, um, sometimes you have to oppose the power structure. Sometimes you have to oppose oppression, right? That's how the world changes, right? That's what he was saying earlier. You know, it's not like I said, 
people don't just wake up one morning and decide, you know what, let's let's just stop oppressing this group of people. That doesn't the, the world doesn't work that way. People have the oppressor uh, or the the oppressed person has to stand up against the oppressor. Okay, uh, and that's how the world changes, right? Um, the people in India, you know, stood up against the British Empire to sort of win their country, right? That's what happened. Uh, um, you know, uh, he gives an example here. Uh, this is interesting. He says, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was, quote, illegal. It was, quote, illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. And he's like, but yet, you know, if I was in Hitler's Germany, I would have tried to help out Jewish people. That's what he says. And I probably would have been gotten in trouble for that. You know, I would have, he says, uh, I would have, um, I would have uh, aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. Um, if today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobey, disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. So he's saying that uh, that these are these are things that he would um, he would do. He's like, like you know, and you guys would not oppose me if I was doing those things, but you are opposing me because this is about blacks in America, right? And somehow that's different, right? And he's sort of asking him that question, like, hey, why is this different for you, right? And he's, what's interesting here is he's sort of asking, one thing I really like about this essay is, is that it's, um, it's inviting because what he's saying to them is, is like, you should be on my side. And why are you on my side? Right? You're sort of asking them that question. A very good question. You should be supporting me. You say, actually, that's the thing is these religious leaders say that they, um, they do support his goals, right? But they're just, but they're, they're not helping, right? They're not helping, um, uh, this kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, position they've taken, he doesn't see as being uh, a helpful one, you know, to sort of condemn him in the newspaper for his actions without really appreciating the full extent of what he's having to take on here, right? Maybe. Have they even, like, he sort of, maybe hopefully that they're getting to think about this. What's, what's interesting is, though, is that King also knew that this, um, this essay was going to not just be published as a reply, just he wasn't just sending this as a letter to these guys. He knew this letter was going to get published in newspapers, right? And it was going to get published, probably get picked up and get published all over the place when it gets got released to the media. Um, and once it was published, it was, um, you know, it was going to become kind of like this definitive statement, right, for the civil rights movement. So, so in addressing their concerns, he was not only um, addressing them, but he was really addressing the whole country. So keep that in mind, that King, King sort of knew what he was doing here when he was sort of writing this letter. Um, the other thing that we should, should maybe not be lost on us is that um, he's writing a letter from jail to a group of uh, um, religious leaders, some of whom are Christians. Um, and anybody who's a Christian uh, would... Uh, or anybody, at least anybody, anybody was familiar with the Bible anyway, at least the New Testament, uh, would be familiar with Paul's letters, right? And Paul wrote those letters um, while he was in jail. So, like, there's, and I'm not saying that King was sort of making a direct comparison to say that, hey, like, I'm like Paul or something like that, but but he he was wanting to see people to at least see the parallel, right? That they're, that like, hey, uh, there's this active, I, I'm like, uh, I'm being oppressed, right, for trying to help out a community of people, right? And there's other examples we might look at in history of people who were actively um, oppressed uh, and suppressed uh, by more powerful groups for trying to speak up on behalf of the oppressed. And uh, he's, he's trying to get them to, to sort of see this. Um, and to then say like, like, well, wh whose side should you be on, right? The side of the oppressor or on the side of the oppressed, right? Um, and he's basically saying that your religion, 
calls you to be on the side of the oppressed person. You should be trying to help us, right? We share the same values, right, is basically what he's saying, right? Um, so I think that's an interesting point, that he's anybody who shares the goals of racial equality in America, he's saying that you really should be on our side. You shouldn't be opposed to me, uh, and you shouldn't be concerned when you see people, my people getting arrested. You should be saying, like, why are they getting arrested? You know, um, these, these are the people who are trying. That's what he says here. You know, eventually uh, the South will know who its true heroes are, meaning that uh, um, our country is going to get in, in the future. When we look back on this time period, we're going to look on it very differently. Right. And we're going to know who was fighting for, for, for what was right and who was fighting for what was what was immoral or wrong. Right. And uh, um Discrimination and racism are wrong, right? And uh, and he says, by the way, like the whole world is starting to change, right? Actively throughout the world, he he talks about this that that um, uh, countries are throwing off the kind of uh, shackles of colonialism and imperialism. Uh, that these these things are kind of falling away, right? Um, and colonialism and imperialism are really the the roots of like the modern, you know, this where all this sort of uh, you know, the, the racial sort of uh, um, divides uh, that we have throughout the world. That's where those have come from, really, you know. Um, and so, I mean, not completely, but, uh, um, but like the, the, um, a lot of the really serious uh, racial issues, uh, certainly um, that's, that's where uh, they come from. Certainly the, the issues involving um, uh, um, uh, whites, right, you know, uh, um, and their oppression of uh, white Europeans uh, uh, and whites, uh, um, uh, and their oppression of, of various groups of people, right, um, uh, because Europe was very successful and powerful um, for a while and was, did that through the active uh, suppression and exploitation of various groups of people throughout the world. Um, including African Americans, right, um, uh, who were brought here, as I mentioned, as slaves, right, um, and have been waiting around, even though they, they considered Americans, right, they uh, have been waiting around to really have their rights for, for since the 1600s, basically, right, uh, you know, so that I mean, when were the first uh, slaves brought over probably in the early 1600s late 1500s possibly but yeah um and he's saying look the world's changing do you, wh which way do you want it? which side do you want to be on you know the wind's blowing this way and the world is changing are you going to go with it or are you going to fight against it right and then how is history going to judge you right subsequently right um that's, I think, one thing he's sort of saying here. Um, they, they called him an extremist, right? That the, the King's actions qualified him to be an extremist. And he's like, you know what? A lot of people have been extremists, like good people, active people trying to do things. He even, you know, mentions people like, you know, Jefferson and uh, um, uh, Martin Luther and Jesus, right? People, all three people who, who in various ways could be considered, who could be considered at their time extremists, right, in their views. Um, uh, um, he says, well, I had hoped that the white moderate would see this need. Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race, and still fewer have the vision to see the injust that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. Um, he's sort of succumbing to a moment of despair there, right? But the interesting thing is, is that, that he's still sort of inviting us to sort of come in. He's sort of saying to, you know, white people who might be reading this in their local newspaper, like, look, like, which side are you going to be on? You know, maybe I've been too optimistic, but um, maybe you can, you know, still come in and help us, right? Or at least support us, right? Um, and of course, that was, that was, uh, uh, you know, something that, 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 that did happen, right? You know, he did 
you know, and and uh, and he does acknowledge that this isn't everybody, right? You know, there are uh, white people who actively put their lives on the line to help them out and who are part of their movement, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, he's the the white community at large though was not sort of receptive, right? So. Um, so that's that's what he's sort of addressing there. The the white moderate, as he calls him, uh, is uh, not been a helpful person, <laughs> right? You know, uh, in change of this because the white moderate seems to prefer things to remain the same, and when things remain the same, basically what that means is in this case it means that there remains that these people are going to remain disenfranchised. They're going to remain without their rights, right? So we see why that's a problem. Okay. All right. I think that's probably uh, uh, most everything I wanted to cover in there. Um, uh, but this, this is an amazing essay. Um, uh, so um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'll post some questions uh, for us to talk about. And uh, all right. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you next time.